Well, here we are continuing through the Gospel of John. So let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 8, verses 39 to 47. John chapter 8 ends with a massive crescendo of a proclamation of the deity of Jesus Christ. And please know this, when you proclaim Jesus as the only Son of God come down from heaven to save sinners from their eternal destruction, you may not get people to agree with you. No, they may want to pick up stones and stone you, which proves who they really follow. Which brings me to the title of today's sermon. As we look in the Gospel of John, there's one thing that Jesus is really going to be highlighting for these people. And the title is this, Who's Your Daddy? Who's Your Daddy? And so let me invite you, if you're able to, to rise for the reading of the infallible, inerrant Word of the living God. This is Jesus continuing in this discussion with not only the people, but the leaders of the Jews there in the temple. And so Jesus is discussing with them the fact that they are not acting like Abraham is their fathers. And they answer him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. And they said to him, We are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies but because i tell the truth you do not believe me which one of you convicts me of sin if i tell the truth why do you not believe me whoever is of god hears the words of god the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Your Word says that the grass withers and the flower fades, but Your Word, O God, will stand forever. And as it stands, O God, it will convict us of who we really follow. And so, Father, we pray that You would bless not only the reading of Your Word, but the exposition of it upon us this day. For we ask these things in Christ's name and for His glory. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus has been talking with the Jews for quite some time. And He's basically telling them that He is the Christ. But more than that, He's telling them that he is actually God in the flesh. And that's how he's going to end John chapter 8. That is what is going to provoke them to want to pick up stones and stone him. And right now, as Jesus is teaching these people who he is, some are claiming to believe and others are outright not believing. So how do you determine who's actually believing and who's not? 
Well, that's actually a question for all of us as well. So I ask you this morning, how do you prove your faith? How do you prove that you have truly made a profession of faith and you have a possession of faith? How do you prove that you are a believer in Jesus Christ? Not just that He existed, but that He is the Savior of all those who call upon His name. That He is the Lord of all those who not only confess Him as Savior, but as God in the flesh. How do you prove your faith? Well, we should also ask then the question, how do you prove you're in the family of God? Because the Bible tells us that if we believe on Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. So how do you prove that? How do you prove it to yourself? How do you prove it to an unbelieving world around us? As we go throughout these verses, it's important that we ask ourselves, do I really have to show proof of faith? To which I would say, oh, yes, you do. Yes, we do. I do. Each and every day in the way that we live. I want to ask you this morning, we've prayed over and over again to our Father and our God. When you pray to the Father, how do you know He is your heavenly Father? How do you know that that profession of faith is true? Jesus is having discourse with these men and, and women as well that are around there, right? Back and forth about who their father is. There's one thing that Jesus makes very clear in these verses. It's something that, you know what, we as human beings don't like to hear. In fact, I can tell you right now, I have never heard a sermon where a minister has said, that the unbeliever has, has as their father, Satan. But that's, that is the reality. That's what Jesus is teaching in the verse before us. Outside the family of God, Satan is your father. It's not something that is expounded upon, but it's clearly evident in these verses. You are either following God or you are following the prince of the power of the air, as Paul says in the book of Ephesians. So outside the family of God, the reality is that Satan is your father. But, and praise be to God for the butts of the Bible, but in Christ, we are children of God. John says that right there in the opening of the gospel. Chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And so we've always got to look, when the Bible tells us that we have this because of Christ. We have to say to ourselves, well, what do we have if we don't have Christ? Well, if you are in Christ, you are in the family of God, and therefore you can call God your Father. But if you are not in Christ, then you are still in the family of Satan, and Satan is your Father. And we prove that by how we live. So the same goes by if we claim to have God as our Father. So how do we prove our faith? How do we prove that we have saving faith in Christ? Well, it's simple. Through our works. Through how we live. Now don't get this twisted. Our works do not save us, but our works are evidence of the fact that we are saved. How we live, how we think, how we speak tells not only ourselves, but sometimes we're not listening, sometimes we're not looking, but it tells others, it tells the world, and it tells other confessing believers in whose family we are. James, the brother of Christ, says this, faith without works is what? Dead. Now, it's interesting that he uses that term, dead. He doesn't say it's nullified. He doesn't say it's fake. He uses the term dead because he understands that those who are not in Christ are still dead in their trespasses and sins. But those who are in Christ are alive in Christ. Many people misunderstand what James is speaking about in James chapter 2. 
They think that works are the, are, are the, are, are the reason or, or, or the cause of our salvation. No, no, no. Works are the evidence of our salvation. I've often used this illustration, and I love this illustration, and it helped me understand the relationship between faith and works. And so I put up there a tree, and below the surface you can see the roots. And it reminds us that faith is the root of our salvation, and works are the fruit of our salvation. Now, many of you know how to plant plants. I'm still trying to figure that one out. But you know that if the plant doesn't take root, there will be no fruit. And so the root is our, faith is at the root of our salvation and works are the fruit of our salvation. That's why John says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is died, dead, and behold, the new has come. And so, this is what Jesus is unfolding little by little in the verses before us today. But in order for us to have a deeper understanding of what Christ is speaking about, I want to look at James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. And James says this, What good is it? My brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works. In other words, he's already questioning the one who claims to be a believer but is not living like a believer. And then he gives us an example. Can that faith save him? It's a rhetorical question. No. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? Right? So your words aren't enough. Jesus doesn't want our cheap talk. No, he says you got to walk the walk. If you truly believe, then you got to live like that. And then James finishes with this in verse 17. So also, or in like manner, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He's saying you're claiming to have faith. But if you never put that faith in practice, if you never feel compelled to put that faith in practice, to live out that faith, then I'm pretty sure you have no faith at all. This is the state of affairs of the people in Jesus' day. They claim to have this massive faith, and they did a lot of things, but when it came to the moment of truth, to exercise their faith in the presence of the Christ, in the presence of God in the flesh, they were failing miserably. If you claim to have faith in God, you will exhibit works that prove it. Some people go throughout the life saying, I don't have to prove anything to anyone. And maybe that may be true, but you do to God. God wants you to live your faith in the public square, to not shrink back, but to stand boldly as a confessing believer in Christ, as bold as Christ did, knowing that they wanted to pick up stones and stone him. In fact, he's going to even tell them, you're looking to kill me. How many of us would stick around in a conversation if we truly knew those people wanted to kill us for our faith? We'd cut tail and run. But not Jesus. If you claim to have faith in God, you, you will exhibit works of faith. If you claim that God is your Father, you will live in proof of it. If you claim that God is your Father, you won't, even, you won't only pray, my Father and my God. You will live like my Father and my God. Understanding that He sees us all the time. That He's by us all the time. That He's only a prayer away in order to enrich us. In order to edify us. In order to strengthen us. To face the battles before us. So as we look at the Gospel of John, please keep in mind that Jesus is going to remind the people who's their daddy. 
And I'm going to define that statement for you. It's kind of a slang, it's not kind of, it is, it's a slang statement. But there's truth in that statement that can be equated right back to these verses. And so let's look at the verses before us today. And we're going to begin by going through verses 39 to 41. And in these verses we see the denial of truth always exposes who our Father truly is. So you can say that you believe, you can say that you trust, but when we're, when we're, when we're doused with the cold water of truth, and that's what, that's what truth is, right? You ever have cold water thrown on you, especially on a real hot day? Someone thinks they're funny and they come over and they throw a cup of cold water on you, right? It is shocking, right? And for some people, maybe most, right, you want to hit somebody, right? You're like, oh, right? And so that's how truth is. When truth is doused upon the heat of unbelief, we really see what people are made of. And so here's their reply to Jesus. They answer him, Abraham is our father. And it's important for us to understand why they're making this statement. You see, they're looking at their lineage. They're looking at um, the race in which they were born. And we know from Old Testament that our lineage is no proof of our faith. I have many Jewish friends and when we, and that are Christians, and when we talk, I always talk, I say, you know what, you got one up on me, you're the chosen people, baby, you know, and they, we always laugh, and there's that, and he goes, but you're, and they tell me, but you're grafted in, you're part of Israel as well, and I'm like, amen, brother, praise be to God, right, but just because you grow up in a specific family, just because you're taken to church with your parents, just because you're raised in the church, what Jesus is going to show them does not mean that you're saved. That's not proof of your salvation. So I have here, lineage is not a proof of faith. It's not. It just isn't. There are many kids that come to church with their parents and they grow up to, not, to show that they're not believers at all. And this is what's happening here. They're claiming that Abraham is their father. And now Jesus is going to challenge them as he challenges us all the time. Oh, you say you're a believer? Well, what are you doing to show that you are a believer? And so at the latter half of verse 39, he says, Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. Notice how he begins the statement there. If, right? If. In other words, that if casts doubt upon what you just said. And this is what Jesus is doing. And he's actually insulting them. Now people say, well, the last place you want to be insulted is in church. The last person you want to be insulted by is the minister. But this is a good insult. Because Jesus is trying to insult them into salvation. To shock them. To doubt that cold water of truth upon them. To shake them out of their unbelief. And sometimes Jesus does that with us as well, right? I can't tell you how many times I was reading Scripture and I was shocked by what was being written in there about man and then cut to my own heart about the fact that that's you, Mike. That's you that God is talking about. You're that guy. And this is what Jesus, he's saying, if you were. He is insulting them purposely because what he's actually saying is, you're not. You're not children of Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing. Notice the word he used there. You would have works. The same type of works that Abraham did. Well, then we got to ask ourselves, well, what did Abraham do? So let's go through a couple of things. What did Abraham do? Well, Abraham, the Bible says, believed God, that is, believed everything about God, and when he believed, it was counted to him as righteousness. Right? We find that in Genesis chapter 15, and of course, Paul speaks about it in Romans chapter 4. But more than that, right? we read about it in Hebrews chapter 11. That's the chapter on faith. So Abraham believed God. And what Jesus is saying in contrast here is, you don't believe me. And he's going to say that later on. And so we've got to ask ourselves as well, we've got to point these scriptures back at us and say, am I living like I believe God? God, like I believe Christ? Am I living like I believe this word? Or is it just something 
useful to me. You see, to the people of that day, Abraham was useful to them. We are the children of Abraham. But what else did Abraham do? Well, Abraham received the Lord. He took the Lord in. It was his pleasure to receive the Lord and worship and serve the Lord in humble submission. Where do we find that? Genesis chapter 18. You remember when the three men came to see Abraham because they were heading on down to Sodom and Gomorrah? What did Abraham do? He ran out to meet them. And then he started calling one of them Lord. And the Bible says then he went down on his knees and began to worship him. And so in theology, we say that that was a pre-incarnation of Jesus. And he kept calling him Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. He kept referring to him in the manner in which you would refer to God. He says the creator, right? The one who will judge the world. He worships him. He gives all that he can. It says he, he finds a choice calf. He gets fine flour in order to make him cakes. He says, rest your feet my Lord. He received the Lord. So Jesus is saying, if Abraham was your father, you would receive me. You would worship me. You would love me. You would throw everything at my feet. Well, what else did Abraham do? Abraham trusted God. He trusted God with everything. Even his precious son. The very son that God told him he would have at a very late age. He trusted God and was willing to offer up his son, Isaac, his only son, a a a, a figuring of the Christ to come as a sacrifice to God. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 22. So Abraham believed God in every way, and he lived out his belief. He lived out his faith. He showed proof of his faith. But know this, when you study all of that about Abraham, he didn't do it in order to prove to God anything. It was just his natural reaction to God. In other words, it was buried deep within the intentions of Abraham's heart. To love God, to worship him, uh, to receive him. And what Jesus is telling these people is, you're nothing like Abraham. That's why he says, if you were Abraham's children. Notice he's saying children, because he's actually going to tell them whose children they really are. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the things, the works that Abraham did. And then he shows them the contrast. He said, no, no, but now... You seek to kill me. Abraham sought to glorify the Lord, to receive him. You seek to kill me and get me out of your sight. And then he refers to himself in this way, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Now, many people in our day claim that they have heard from God. Not many people define that. Whenever anybody tells me that, I ask them to define how did you hear from God. It's not to say that they did or didn't. But people wouldn't speak like that in the old day unless they were a false prophet. But the manner with which it's rendered in the Greek says that he heard personally from God. He has that intimate of a relationship with God that he heard directly from him. Now this is going to be a shocking statement for anyone to hear during that time but it's one that only Jesus can make. He's saying, I am a man who has come from God. I have heard directly from him. And you seek to kill me. He says, this is not what Abraham did. When the messengers came to Abraham and they told him that they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham didn't lift his hand to strike them down. And we know that Abraham's heart burned for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew that it was corrupt, but he was there trying to negotiate with God to save the people. He didn't say, no, no, you can't do that and tackle him. No, Abraham knew that whatever God would do would be righteous. So what's happening here is that these people are proving who their father is. They're proving who is truly moving them. They are proving who their daddy is. 
Now, as I said, that there's a, this is a slang term, and I want to read it for you. Who's your daddy is a slang expression used to show dominance over someone else. So if you get someone in a struggle, right, and you overpower them, what do you whisper in there? Who's your daddy now? Right? If you beat someone at chess, right, you've overpowered them, you've outthought them. As you lean back, you say, who's your daddy now? Right? If you get one over on someone that thought that they were going to get one over on you, you kindly smirk and say, who's your daddy now? But Jesus is turning it around on them. He's telling them, I'm going to tell you who your father is. On the outside, you look as neat as this guy does in his suit. But on the inside, you're someone else. And this is what he says in verse 41. You are doing the works of your, you're doing the works your father did. Notice he's saying doing. He's speaking about their actions. And we all know that our actions are based upon the intentions of our hearts. You ever do something wrong? You say, oh, I didn't mean to do it because you feel bad. You finally came to realization. That was a bad thing. And the other person says, no, you did mean to do it. And if you're really honest with yourself, you say, yeah, you know, I did mean to do that. Right? But Jesus is going right to the heart of their intentions. And what he's telling them is this. Your works are proving Who's your daddy? As I said, our works prove that we are children of God, but the reverse or the opposite is true as well. And so they said to him, here's how they answer him. They're not going to argue. That, I mean, they're going to argue with him instead of addressing and saying, well, what do you mean that we're of a different father? Here they say to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. Now you say, well, that's kind of weird. Where's that coming from? He didn't say that you're born of sexual immorality, right? Well, many theologians believe that they're actually trying to insult Jesus here. And let me explain why. Because they know that Jesus' father, physical father, is Joseph. But yet he's claiming that God is his father. So what they're saying is, who's, you, you, might, you perhaps don't even know who your father is. That's why you're saying it about us. Perhaps you're born of sexual immorality, Jesus, right? Because you apparently have conflicting messages about who your father is. But we know who we are born of. And then they say this to double down on their insult. We have one father, even God. You see how that kind of connects with the sexual immorality in the verses before? You claim to have two fathers, but we have one, even God. So you see, rather than asking Jesus to unpack what he's saying, they just turn and insult him. And isn't that the way the world is? Whenever the world is confronted with truth and it can't handle it anymore, what does it resort to? Insult. Ah, oh, well, you Christians are the same. You know? You're all nuts. A bunch of Bible thumpers, right? You're too far to the right or too far this or too far that. You guys are extreme, they love to, 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 to label everything that they don't like. The world loves to label everything it doesn't like with extreme. Well, let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with being an extreme believer in Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I would say we need a little bit more extreme people to trust in Christ, to live like Christ called us to live. Which brings us to verses 42 to 44. And in them we see that no matter how fervent we are in our denial, and this is what we're going to see in the people, the Bible always reveals the truth about us. You can try to be as strong a believer in the fact that you are right. And you can have so many worldly proofs. And what I mean by that is whose family I was born in, what church I grew up in. But the Bible is always going to Lift the veil and show us the truth of our lives. And Jesus is going to go back at them, verse 42. So he said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Abraham loved the Lord. And if you were Abraham's children, if God were your father, you would love me. I think about that every morning. I try to pray, Lord, I love you. Help me to love you more. Because I know that in my current state, I can only love you so much. Help me to love you to such a degree, O oh God, that my life bears fruit 
of it. If, you, if God were your father, you would love me. With kind of, which kind of connects to John 14, 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? So Jesus is saying, if you truly say that you love me, you're going to have proof of that. You will live like you truly love me. And then he goes on to say to them, for I came from God and I am here. So now he puts aside this statement that he's been saying, my father, my father, and he connects his father to God. For I came from from God. Remember before he says, you don't know where you came from or where you're going, but I know where I came from. And he's telling them this. He said, I have been in the presence of God. Not only have I spoken to him in his presence, but I have been in his presence. He's given them proof after proof after proof of where he came from. He says, I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. So we can put it together like this. I was in his presence. He spoke to me, and then he sent me. He gave me a charge, and I am here to fulfill it. Just like Moses received the messengers of God, you need to receive the messenger of God. But unlike how Moses received them, you are not receiving me. And then Jesus is going to hit them with a few compelling questions. Questions that we would do well to try to answer on our own as well. Questions that bring the pieces of the puzzles together for the confessing believer. And the way these are written, it's almost as if Jesus is asking the question and then he's staying silent. So that's how I'm going to read them today. First question, why do you not understand what I say. And he waits a little bit. Why do you not understand what I say? And he's given them an opportunity to answer him. But they don't. They can't. There is no answer for that. Has he said anything wrong? No, he hasn't. So he comes back at them with the answer. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. The sinner, the unbeliever, when they are confronted with the word of God, lives like this. I don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. I'd rather hear anything else but the word of God. Anything else brings me comfort. The word of God does not. He says, you know why you don't hear what I say? You know why you don't understand it? Because you cannot bear to hear my word. And again, these verses will be lived out at the end of John chapter 8. And then he gives them some reasoning because Jesus is always teaching. And he says this. He says, here's why you can't bear to hear my words. Because you are of your father, the devil. Boom! Boom! It's like if, if, if cold water wasn't enough, now Jesus puts some ice in that water and he insults them. And that's the way scriptures are, the, the scriptures are, beloved. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The scriptures will insult the unbeliever, but that insult could save their lives. So don't ever separate yourself from the word of God when you're sharing it. You know that this may insult someone. It may, it may cause anger and, and it may cause this uh, a sense of fear to come over the person. Say it anyway. Because sometimes we need to be doused with ice cold water. And Jesus creates this massive chasm between what they claim and what he knows about them. They say they're of the fa- that Abraham is their father, that God is their father. He says, no, 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 no. Satan is your father. And then he shows them evidence. And your will is to do your father's desires. Your will is to carry out the proof of the fact that Satan is your father. And then he gives a little bit of history of Satan. Because he knows they know this history. 
And he says, he, referring to Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. What beginning? Our beginning. What did he do to Adam and Eve? He led them into sin. God says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And Satan says, no, you won't. His lie led to their spiritual death, to our death as well. So he says, here's who Satan is. Here's who your father is. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And so we've got to think back then when we were unbelievers as well. When I was an unbeliever, there was no truth in me. That is no truth that I would cling to. I understand that there was truth out there, but I would have nothing to do with it. Why? Because at that point, I was a son of Satan. That's the truth, beloved. And he goes on to detail who Satan is. He says, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Other Bible references have something a little bit more closer to the Greek. It says, out, when he lies, he speaks his native tongue. Right? That's who he is. He is the father of lies. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So he puts it out there to them. Jesus holds nothing back. If you ever thought that Jesus was a cream puff, Think again. Jesus does not care. He understands this is what they need to hear. This is what they need to understand in order to break the back of their religiosity. And many people today still live the same way. They believe because I go to church and I go to the church where they've got all the robes and they've got the really good pious hats and we have the incest. All those things are nice. They have the incest. And but because I go there and I come up and I receive the communion and I'm an active member of that place, that that is what saves me. No, that's a lie, beloved. That's a lie rooted in the person of Satan. The Bible clearly teaches that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Anything else sends you straight to hell. I have here the proof of faithlessness can be found in man's Satan-like behavior. The proof of faithlessness can be found in man's Satan-like behavior. You know how we say if you're a believer in Christ, you are to live Christ-like? Well, what's the opposite of that? If you're not a believer in Christ, you live Satan-like. That's the reality. That's what Jesus is teaching us here, which brings us to the final verses before us, verses 45 to 47. And in them we see that denial always crumbles under the weight of truth. In doing so, reveals our true spiritual state. Jesus goes on, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. And once again, he hits them with another question. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I am wrong, if I am lying, earlier you said that, you know, he has, you know, a demon if I am lying, which one of you convicts me of sin? Now remember where he's at. He's in the temple. And if he's lying, he's making massive blasphemous statements. And they are warranted at that point, if not obligated at that point, to stone him to death. But he says to them, which one of you convicts me of sin? And you're not going to hear a peep because they do not have anything that they convict him of sin. And this is why he says, if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? No one can convict me of sin this very moment, but then why don't you believe me? You can't convict me of sin because you know I'm telling the truth. Then why do you not believe me? And then he follows up with a statement of reality, a statement of clarity. 
Whoever is of God hears the words of God. In other words, he's saying, I was with God. He spoke to me, and I'm coming to you, and I'm bringing his word. Whoever has truly believed in God, it is that person who hears and heeds and humbly submits to the word. And in doing so, they submit to God. And again, there's no reply because they know that he is not lying. They know that he has not sinned. They don't like what he has said, but they can't find a single thing to convict him on. And perhaps Jesus was even quiet after this. But then he ends with, the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. You thought you were, but you're not. Beloved, as we look at these words, knowing the end story, it's so important for us to realize that Christ died on that cross so that we, whom the Spirit has, has regenerated, would believe in Him, would believe in the horror of the cross, of the crucifixion, and then see the light of the cross of Christ. And not only see that light, but live in proof of that light. He died so that we could be adopted into the family of God. And he says, if you love me, if you understand what I did for you, then you would heed my words. Then you would walk in my commandments. Then you would live in proof of the fact that God is now your Father. Keep this in mind, beloved. Keep it in mind that anyone who is not of God has Satan as their father. And that should lead us to a great deal of care and, 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 and prayer for the unbeliever. Because I tell you right now, no one wants to die as a child of Satan. There is nothing but eternal misery that hangs on the other side of death. But because we are in Christ, as we live out our lives like God is our Father, He will use us to bring all of those out of darkness and into light. There's a verse that I often quote. You find it for those of you who are wearing the bracelet, right? Galatians 2.20. It's an affirmation of our faith in Christ. It's an affirmation of the fact that we are called to live a different life. And it always says, I, 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 because it's Paul speaking. But I want to make it very personal today. Because if you have confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then you, then me, we must live and show proof of that faith. Let me share this verse with you. If you, I've changed all the, use to, all the eyes to you, if you have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. And the life you now live in the flesh, you must live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. That's how we're to live, beloved. That's how we prove who's our father. Then we no longer go by the term, who's your daddy? Because we know who our father is. Is. We're no longer under the stronghold of Satan, but we are under the grace of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Well, let me share with you just a, three key takeaways that I have for the verses before us. And the first one is this. The believer in Christ is no longer of the family of Satan. So abandon your old way of living and thinking. 
Yeah, if anyone be in Christ is a new creation, the old has died, and behold, the new has come. If you have confessed Christ as Lord, then you are of the family of God. Then God is your Father. Live, think, and be under that understanding. And the second, in Christ we are called to believe the teachings of our Father as revealed in the Bible. Jesus says He came with a word from God and He gave it to us. Well, believe it. <laughs> I know it seems hard for a lot of people, right? Especially for unbelievers, but not for us. Believe it. Cling to it. Thrive in it. Speak it. Share it with others. And finally, proof of our spiritual family status should be seen in the intentions of our actions. Right? What we intend to do with our life is proof of our new spiritual family status. And so let us live like we are truly of the family of God, knowing all that Jesus Christ has done to save us. We see here at the end of this chapter, it's not going to end well for Jesus, but that never stops him. And he will continue all the way to the cross. Why? So that we could be adopted into the family of God. Praise be to God. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Our Holy Father and most gracious God, we thank you, O God, that we have been brought into your family, adopted by you, O God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. We know, Heavenly Father, that it is a privilege that we can call you Father. For in no age before Christ could anyone call you Father. But here we are because of what Jesus has done for us. And so, Lord God, help us to live like we truly believe. Help us to live for the glory of the gospel that has saved us so that others, as they see us, O oh God, as they interact with us, would come to know your Son, Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.